Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me for another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have a bona fide legend with me today. He was a Navy trained for the Navy SEAL team. He's he knows all about metaphysics and magic with a K. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about him. I have with me Dr. Richard Allen Miller. You guys know him as Doc Ram. A lot of you guys know him when you see this video. He's a polymath, a solid state physicist, a metaphysicist, agriculturalist, herbalist, author, and inventor. A prodigy from the early age, his work has been fundamental in scientific and metaphysical development. And I want to thank, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for joining me. How are you today? Going bald and from unnatural causes. I pulled it out. Oh, <laughs> that's funny no um, it's not it, it, my girlfriend cut my ponytail of 47 years off and made a voodoo doll oh no. god oh god that's the worst do you do you think she really did are you are you joking or are you being serious i'm serious no well not about the voodoo doll but yeah she cut it off. i went stop <laughs> no <laughs> it was gone it was like gone in heartbeat I, uh, when I was a uh, physicist training SEALs in the early 70s, I put SEAL Team 1 together. I was not their team leader. I was the guy that chose the team leader <laughs> and uh, trained him. Uh, things like, well, let me give you a little history. I grew up in the Philippines. And uh, in 1948, my mother worked into a China theater with Kodak. And so they stuck me in Buddhist missionary schools in the Philippines. And I didn't even speak English until fourth grade, third grade, third grade, I started speaking English when I came back to the United States. But because I was Caucasian and I had to walk to school every morning at four and a half years old, I was going to Shaolin Temple. I was a Northern Shaolin is the form that I study called Hangal rather than Hungar, a very rare form. And only one other person used it. And I grew up with him when I went to school in Seattle. When my parents came back, it was Bruce Lee, Skip Ellsworth, Fred Williams. And uh, our teacher, our Sifu was uh, John Leon. And you check him out on the internet. He was the one that chose Chi, where he could just go Bruh! and just knock someone over. And if you watch the fight between Sonny Liston and Cassius Clay, when Cassius Clay hit him with that roundhouse and knocked Sonny Liston up and down flat on his back, on closer inspection, you'll notice that Cassius Clay didn't even touch Sonny Liston. He was, that's, what he, he, that's pretty he, amazing. Subtle body. What's that? I said it's pretty amazing. He was using chi. I, I never saw I never saw the fight, but I I I, I saw a lot of Muhammad Ali's fights. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of Bruce Lee and Muhammad Ali. But I wanted to show people this first before we get too far into this. The reason why we're here today is Dr. Richard Allen Miller's new book. You can see it right here. Uh, he gave me a copy of it. He sent me a copy, The Non-Local Mind in a Holographic Universe. And we're going to be talking about that as well. It's an amazing book. I, I took notes on it today, just today because I was at work all week. I didn't have a chance to read a lot of it, but I just went through it now. And there's some really good stuff in here about Oregon, Bucky Balls, um, just consciousness, Timothy Leary's Eight Worlds of Consciousness, Mind Control, how the 1% control the rest, electromagnetic radiation, pollution, uh, mind control through GMOs, easy water, activated water, Jerry Pollock, alkaline water, microtubules, uh, faith healing, chi, like he was just talking about, the teachings of Don Juan and the shamans. And that's as far as I got. Right? But we, we can go through any and all of that or whatever you want to do. And I wanted to get into magic too. And I think magic... <laughs> It all it all fits together, right? Like magic is how um, we, we use we, magic is how we we can navigate uh, our way through this whole topic. Uh, yeah, sorry. Lazy, okay, hand magic, you know, pickpocketing that kind of thing is sleight of hand. And magic with a K, I will define as sleight of mind. <laughs> you <laughs> consciousness where you are right now isn't real. It's a shared dream where you and I, and using some game or mind control stuff, you, you think you're now communicating to, what is it, 5,000 students or whatever, but that isn't actually true. There are dream states, like lucid dreaming, 
that have even more content to reality than consciousness does. And that's, and, that makes sense because I, I, I tell people this all the time on my show. I feel like sometimes I'll have a dream where I feel like I'm living a whole other life and I'll have lived a whole other life in a dream for a week and then I'll wake up and it's only been eight hours. You know, so what, what just happened in that eight hours? Was that lucid dream real? Was that another reality? Um, yeah. And uh, my mentor, the one that book is dedicated, Dr. Stanley Krippner, if you uh, read about him, uh, his book, Dream Telepathy, was the work he did at Maimonides Dream Labs when he did his studies on, uh, on all the different kinds of sleep states that there are and so on like that. Stan was the one that introduced me to Edgar Mitchell in seven, 1970, so I could be at Mission Control in 1971 to do the ESP study for NASA. At that time, ESP and hypnosis were considered pseudoscience. And uh, what I am is your lead scout in physics. But it's very important to remember something here. Uh, you know, today hypnosis is used as an extremely powerful tool for pain control, you know, like dentistry and things of that nature, rather than sticking a needle in your mouth and numbing the outside of your face. Um, I can do that with a sledgehammer. And we take the <laughs> tooth out. Of it. I mean, you know, the tooth removed next. You know, and, um, there is all kind of humor is the only thing I have found for myself anyway, to get through this mess, because physics actually won't get you there. It'll get you close, but not, it won't take you there. For example, but I would say you can go halfway to the door. Now that means you can get really close to the door, you know, <laughs> but you're never by that protocol. Why? Well, physics starts with an assumed truth. Like the shortest distance between two points, the Earth's round. But if space is curved, I can prove that the Earth is flat with tensor math. Which one is it? And the correct answer is yes, because that's how limited our ability to conceptualize what space is. Same with time. That's why quantum mechanics uh, had to be left aside when I came up with the holographic concept of reality. Gabor got a Nobel Prize. One month earlier, <laughs> I didn't get to go to Stockholm, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, with his hologram, you know, where he had two, he had a uh, two-dimensional, and he shown coherent light through this two-dimensional object, you know, film, and it created a three-dimensional image. And I saw that he went to Stockholm for that. And then because he'd already gone on the holographic thing, that took care of it. But I was the one that saw that what a hologram could be is n dimensions of information collapsed down into n minus one dimensions. So the way fractal, you know, collapse into or out of themselves. Now, here we are 47 years later, and I uh, may be going to Stockholm on this one because there are two Russians the quote from a paper I wrote after the holographic concept, uh, one year later, embryonic holography, that allowed uh, them to make a major breakthrough. Was, that paper, by the way, was classified top secret. That's why I didn't get to go the next year, because uh, I, I took that concept, and expanded it into what we call the holographic universe, i.e. the book you're gonna read. But, 47 years later, here I am writing a new field theory huh? on, on psionic fields, on how there's a new force in nature. And uh, I discussed that in the first book, the ESP induction through hypnosis, because that's how I chose SEAL Team 1. I measured their intuition. I wanted very smart individuals, but uh, I wanted them to be also very intuitive because when you come from your enteric nervous system, you do instinct. You do not by definition make, uh, your, 
make a mistake. You don't do yeah, that. Yeah, because lots and sometimes logical thinking can lead to mistakes because oh, you're thinking yeah. about too much, right? You know, you get your, well, one of the options is I'm going to get killed. If you don't think about it when you're in the interior, you're working on instinct. Yeah, if, yeah. That's, I mean, if you just go purely on instinct in a combat situation, you might be better off than trying to think it out. Like that is absolutely. Yeah, that, that makes sense. The second protocol, by the way, that's how the SEAL Team One got chosen. SEAL Team Two and Three were similar, and then SEAL Team Four was when we turned it over to the Navy. And um, I was working at that time for Navy Intel as a Black Ops group called uh, uh, SEAL Corp out of Amherst. And uh, you might check that out. I'm going to write a, another book called The SEAL Reports. There were 12 reports that I did for SEALs, the SEAL Corp, in terms of uh, what you now would refer to as super soldiers or something equivalent. Um, I'm uh, one of mine that I learned when I was growing up in the Philippines was how to change my perception of time with breath control. And that was a seafood that came down out of Vancouver, uh, out of Victoria, Vancouver, every week to train a small group of us on Tai Chi. And my ability, he, he chose me, I don't know why. I'd already had my martial art thing for 18 years. I'd been boxing. I was a world champion with double sword. And I could do anything. But when he came down, he chose me to teach a secret on how to change your perception of time with breath control. And once you do that, now you can take your martial art to a paranormal level. You, everything is in slow motion, so you have the precision. And uh, bam, pop, and it comes in slowly. So you have the precision hitting it just right. And um, that part, when you see it in the movies where he's on an automobile going over a bridge and he leaps off the car into doing a dive into <laughs> the water. Uh, I remember when I had to do that when I went into Russia. <laughs> I, uh, I, ha I spoke Ruski and I <laughs> wanted, they wanted to stop something in Russia. And so rather than fly under radar to drop me in, I went in solo, I was scared out of my mind. I'm not a spook, I'm a science nerd, young kid, you know, that never grew up. And I dove out at 20,000 feet, broke a world record with an EVA suit and went down like a missile. <laughs> and just before the right moment, I deployed into a kind of a sailboat mast and I sailed down and was able to land with my own parachute. The problem was I missed the pickup in the Bering Sea and I was at sea for, oh God. I had to end up drinking my own urine. They found me and they said I was uh, nearly dead. And, uh, but here I am last man standing. <laughs> I've got lots wow. of stories like that. Yeah, there's, I need to have someone maybe do my autobiography. I, the way I want to do it is historically, I want to have pictures. I have a whole bunch of pictures of when I was a little boy building my linear accelerator and uh, when I was working SEAL teams. One, one of the stories I had was uh, I, and this was related to the Philippines because I was Caucasian. And I uh, was in the room with SEAL Team One and I turned the light up. I said, last man standing. <laughs> I could hear them knocking each other out in the dark. And yeah. so the final one came over looking for me and I, I put him down gently and then I turned the light back on. I said, what did you guys all learn? When I said last man standing, he was not expecting me, on, me to be on my back, hitting him upward. Because that's <laughs> how I learned how to fight. His hordes are on top of me and I had to get him off me. How do, how do you do that? <laughs> that's a type of fighting that you may see now in some of your mixed sports stuff. Um, mixed martial arts and stuff like that, yeah, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. The one I, when we went to Peking, US team, I was only one of four that won my match because when I went in the ring, I took the referee out without even looking at him. I just waxed him. 
and then stepped in the ring right into the fight with this kid from China. <laughs> well, I wasn't ready to fight two people. <laughs> and I started the crowd and then everybody got it and then I fought and I won. Uh, the guy that was the best martial arts person I've ever met or historically was uh, Dukes, who was... Uh, <sighs> They made the movie Bloodsport after him. Well, that was a takeoff sort of about him. He was two weights above me. And uh, you knew him? You knew Frank Dukes too? I boxed with him, yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Like, yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. But he was two weights above me. And possibly he had a form of savat, a French form that was deception and could do things I can't do. <laughs> Standing with two legs on either side. And, Boxing downward, I boxed upward. <laughs> I'm on my back. Yeah, um, but his was superior, of course. And uh, <laughs> I, I uh, was very impressed with his boxing. There were others that I, historically Lee had. Bruce Lee had his own form that was interesting. And uh, what dragon means, by the way, when they said "enter the dragon." That form of uh, Shaolin form of martial art is that you're a dragon and everything is done in circles. You're coming in, wiggling in, right, left, right, left, you know, yin and the yang, as if you had a tail behind you wiggling. And so when you did any movement, you had that backlash part of a tail. And that's why they call it dragon form. Um, there's all kinds of them, you know, you have a snake and you have monkey. Yeah. You have all these different forms. They were all based on natural instincts of how different uh, animals would defend themselves instinctively. That's it's pretty interesting. Where you are now going back into your original thinking of why I'm telling the story to you know, give you the fact that everything fits into one thing. Physics itself is one side of your brain, the other is religion, if you want to look at it that way. And they're both can't get you there from here. But your decision making take you into the multiverse. And all the different decisions you make each day, part of you has gone a different way with a different decision. And that's what forms up the multiverse. And the field theory I'm writing now is um, these, the breakthrough that these, these two biologists, Russians did, who's on the proton cloud, the place that's between when a proton is a particle and when it becomes a wave. And that is called a cloud because there's a confusion in there, just like there is when you go from analog to digital and you're losing a group of information between this step and next and it's why the new concepts in speakers went from analog like ar4 speakers and clip yarn to these little cheapy model things <coughs> that don't cost anything they're doing <coughs> excuse me they're doing the same thing right now with lamps if you go to Walmart used to buy 40 watt light bulb. Now what you buy is a four watt LED for the same price. That's the analog to digital form of taking music. And it doesn't matter in regard to the ear and what it's capable of because it's limited, just like your consciousness of awareness is limited. There are four cetacean on this planet that have higher technology than man. And to emphasize that point before we get started in discussing it, if you'd like, I would say to you, how many ants are on your property? And who's terraforming it more? You don't notice certain things, but you're down in the food chain. And when you get hunted by a grizzly bear, <laughs> I have been, I'm scared out of my mind, man. Is this thing smarter than I am? 
and is familiar with the territory and is hungry. Yeah, that's, I never thought about that. We think we we think we're we I mean, we think we're superior to animals just because we have a rifle, but they're actually they're smarter. They know the territory. Yeah, I don't if you have a life over over that decision making with a grizzly bear, let me tell you, man. <laughs> My dad was a bounty hunter, and I learned how how to not hunt certain animals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's, uh, yeah. But, I only do that. That stopped me from hunting as a macho machismo and becoming more of a nerd because I knew my face in the system of all of it. And now I'm realizing that doesn't exist either. <laughs> so that? what is it, what is everything like, like how do we get to like altered states of consciousness, like to where we're, we're accessing like the metaverse and, and where we, where we're achieving goals. Like, you know, like they talk about the law of attraction and stuff like that. And like, well, what does it all mean? And like, and like, for example, like what does this it all mean? That's me as David Copperfield with my empty bowl saying, I want something more. Please, can I have something more? I'm hungry. <laughs> now, hmm. I can make an argument that we're in a Petri dish and we're being manufactured specifically and modified to do certain things like mine gold for Dyson spheres for aliens. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I have to stop. Uh, yes, I would say to you, do aliens exist? And then I would say back to you, how could they not? I, I talk about it a lot on my channel. I, I believe they exist. I, and I, do you uh, think they're there? I mean, because you believe it. I have a little metaphor that says I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't have believed it. <laughs> <laughs> have you had experiences with the grays? Have I? Yes, I had. Yes, I have. I've had uh, two artifacts that I've examined. Uh, the one with the major one was in Chicago, Chicago. I like to call it Chicago. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, that piece, and then I had one single tour at Groom Lake. And I met Krill at level eight. You're not doing a pot, you're doing what is that? You just blew out of your mouth. It's vape. It's a vape. It's a, it's a, it's a nicotine. What is it? Nicotine. Ha, huh, that's my boy. That's what I'm talking about. Nicotine is a anti, uh, it's a uh, insecticide. The best one that plants produce. That's what they plant produces as nicotine to keep the bugs off them. <laughs> it's, 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 it's my only vice. <laughs> I love it, man. I thought you were going to be a vape and leave it with a cape on or something. But uh, I was going to say, you know, vaping is worse than pot. And I don't smoke pot anymore, but I was doing the research for Boeing in 1970, uh, 68, 1968, uh, at what is now called the Space Center in, in Boeing in Seattle. Uh, but it was in South Park. And it was called uh, Boeing Scientific Research Laboratory back then. And I worked under a man named Art Pilgrim. I dated his daughter, Vicky. And it was called Lunar Base Alpha 1. And they had me growing all of these different kinds of plants. And I chose uh, indica. And uh, they're going to get that light right on this one. <laughs> that was 1968. <laughs> and uh, I was the physicist in charge of light. Because today, when I teach children how to grow aquaculture, which is slightly different than hydroponics, uh, hydroponics, we had, the, we had a closed system, Alpha Centauri, in 1968. We didn't need any salts or any organic things. They were all self-contained. And I can tell you the secret I, I discovered back then was all your inorganic salts necessary for growing plants are contained in one third chicken manure, one third rabbit manure, and one third worm casings. You have all three of those, and you have all the inorganic salts in as a physicist. You have all the inorganic salts necessary for a closed system that doesn't see the outside. And we're currently doing that in an aquaculture system in Arapaho. Uh, it's an old Nike missile silo. It's 60 feet down with vertical aquaculture going on, you know, as the water flows downward, it warms up. And so this crop, broccoli, wants this level of water and this temperature, and it wants this kind of light band. And they're different than cauliflower. 
So cauliflower is grown above broccoli. Isn't that interesting? That is. It's so interesting. Yeah, like, just a little piece of information to, so that you get a better sense of it. By the way, that 60 feet is run by three families. As I, thought, I think there are about 14 people in, 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 the, in the group that can feed 4,000 people. Wow. Wow. Close system should the earth go sideways. You have to go underground or whatever. Um, that's what I do as a, as a physicist today. I'm into survival. I'm your MacGyver. I've written a nine volume encyclopedia on non-storable commodities, what you call alternative crops. Alternative crops rotate each year, and that's why there are shortages and surpluses of ginseng or whatever, uh, red peppers, spice trade. And that's why I got into that when I left the military because country that controls spice trade has since recorded history, controlled world trade. That's a fact. And everybody thought it was gonna go from, from uh, Hong Kong into uh, Germany, you know, Hamburg. It, didn't. it went to Canada, Vancouver, BC, where all your spice companies and all your pharmaceutical houses all are in the Okanagans now. They have a presence there. And it's about, I, I think Vancouver now is about six times larger than Seattle. And the wow. primary people that feed that town, that city, um, are um, Punjabi, mostly India. Um, and they're farmers, you know, the local farmers that supply the trade there. The Vancouver is a beautiful place, by the way. I, I, I was like that up there on the island, especially if you get a little further north. You think the beaches in Washington are cool. <laughs> There's little islands all right on up, you know, after you pass the San Juans and uh, the Aleutian. And uh, that's where I did my training with American Indians. I actually was a roadman with the Northern Cheyenne out of Basin. I did the first two peyote rituals sanctioned by Washington State. That, that only two people got sick. When you do things in ritual form, you're celebrating a myth. And when Timothy Leary wrote his Varieties of Psychedelic Experience, it, what his purpose was in that is he said that the Buddhists had four reasons for getting high and only one of them was for escape and recreation. What do you think the other three are? I have no clue. To start your studies, you're gonna get high why don't consciousness, you know, consciousness well, expansion, right? You're, you're yeah, well, if you do it for certain reasons, it turns out I have a new book coming out called Electromagic, where I can simulate any high, including nicotine, if you like, uh, that will, uh, by putting electric currents on the forehead and talking directly to the neurotransmitter, all your drugs, uh, like dimethyltryptamine, uh, and uh, like surgic acid, uh, Athamide. These are toxins, mushrooms. What they do, though, is they have a chemistry that's very similar to, but slightly different than your neurotransmitter. And when your body sees this toxin coming into your body, it freaks out and overproduces its own lookalike chemistry. And that neurotransmitter is dialoguing with subtle bodies outside the physical body, like chi. And that's where we're going to go now, because I'm writing a field theory on how to use that as a tool. I watched a woman once rip a car door off to save her daughter in a flaming automobile. Now, that's impossible from a physics point of view, because the bone and, and muscle and grit in her body are not stronger than steel. And adrenaline did not make that happen. It's something else did. And that's what I'm writing the field theory is how to evolve to the next level where you can become what you think is God. Well, and I was I was I was sorry. The Lord up there is the Lord, man. I know that I know my place in the I couldn't even comprehend what religion I taught comparative religion at Harvard for 11 years. That's my audio books. So 
what is uh, God? That, this is quoting Castaneda now, ready for this one, that which cannot be known. You can experience it, but like an alien, but you can't comprehend it. You can only comprehend in terms of your own capacity to visualize what is and what is not, and when, like space and time. And that's why when you go from an analog to digital system, you lose so much information that Heisenberg wrote an uncertainty principle. The more you know about one thing, the less you know about something else when you convert from analog to digital. And the same thing is true with holographic systems, the way information, not space and time now, information collapsed down into or out of itself. You, you, you have, a, yeah, that's why we have fractal math because they're discrete generators like Mendelbrot or Julia or Ame form. They, they will not allow you to do something slightly different. Whereas the neurotransmitters in your brain are as diverse as the bacteria and viruses and crap that's in your gut. And everybody is different, uniquely so. And the, that is why we became God's favor. We had choice. Problem is, we didn't want to mine gold hunt or Dyson spheres anymore. <laughs> <laughs> or something more, please. <laughs> So, so you're saying that we were, we, we, you, you, so you, you believe this stories of like Sitchin and the Anunnaki that we mine gold for the gods, but we were the creator of all the universe's favorite. As a metaphor, yes, absolutely, because you already conceived that it's possible, and so if it's possible, you, you, can, you can count on it. Anything. This is Merlin quoting Merlin now from the book T. H. White. Anything. Not specifically forbidden is mandatory. If it's possible, you can count on it. <laughs> that makes sense. I like that. And I was well, going to say, so how say, did it, Merlin also put it when they're storming Luther? Luther is storming. Cal oh, I didn't foresee this. <laughs> Wait, isn't isn't the chi how a knockout artist gets his his timing when he knocks someone out like perfect when you see the perfect knockout like I've seen that guy knock a guy other guy out in mixed martial arts in eight seconds and he was because he got the guy so worked up before the fight he was like you know he was egging him on and he was like tennis. his mind yeah, we call it, in tennis we used to call that eating your brain yeah. Yeah, that's it. I like that saying. Yeah, <laughs> going to eat this guy's brain. I when I my double partner was Arthur Ashe when I went to Wimbledon, and uh, I my reaction time on things verged on paranormal. If I could get to the net, you could not ever get by me. I was the man. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. Now Arthur Ashe was a better tennis player than I was. I was always second best. But I was always second best at everything. So thank you, Lord. I, you know, I was a, a jack of all trades. No, that was my father, <laughs> Jack. <laughs> mm. I, yeah, but I, I was very blessed because I'm going to tell you that while they say my IQ is up at 158, 159. The Minnesota Multiphasic Personality in Inventory, or the CPA, the one in California developed, the California's got its own thing, you know. Uh, I'll be back. Uh, their basic is what they're measuring is your adaptability. They're not measuring intelligence. There are many different kinds of intelligence, and I know my place in the scheme of it all, because when I look at my girlfriend, her intuition is so incredible she can touch your body and know where you're hurting in a different another part of the body we call that being empathic like a nurse but there's something more going on and that's the part i'm interested in what's that space in between and how do we get here from there you can't <laughs> yeah so you use your belief systems like a tool round and flat like the earth now you have all the doors accessible. If you look at it this way, these doors are available. Can't go there. But if I look at it this way, then I can. But I can't go there. 
and you choose. And that choosing is the diversity of you in the multi-cloud, uh, what we call the, uh, the multiverse. And I'm going to use a form of Kaufman's knot theory. I'm going to be the little boy scout tying strings into knots. Hoorah. And, <laughs> and then there, you know, this one slips and that one chokes and that one hangs you and da da da. Hangman's knot. You know, there's all kinds of slip knots. There's all kinds. And I was a boy scout made eagle. And I learned my knots. <laughs> and that's the math I'll use. It's probably Kaufman. He has, I'll use a virtual form of his thing when I do this with these Russians. I'm already publishing high technical papers on academia.edu if you want to play. Um, mostly you won't be able to understand the lingo as a vocabulary, you know, using different constructs. This word means, how did they put it in uh, Murder, She Wrote? It's a Z, not the, Z kind of, <laughs> that was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, imaging. See, that's what I do for you. I can create an image in your mind's eye. That's chapter eight, where imagination becomes reality. And that's a little kid on a tricycle and right his rocket ship. <laughs> yeah. What about uh, time, chapter seven, time travel and the true nature of cavitation? Like, is it- What do you think your brain is doing? The cavitation. Do you know what cavitation is? Well, I know what cavity is. It's like when you're two things. Well, it's when a drop of water hits a pool of water. The pool is all water, and a drop of water is a single molecule. What happens when it hits it? Well, it goes down into the water and pops back up again, doesn't it? But yeah. this time when it pops back up, it's no longer a drop of water. What it is, is a bubble of water, exclusion zone water, easy water, <laughs> Jerry Pollock water, um, that has captured the medium in which it fell, which in this case was air in your mind's eye. Could have been helium on Jupiter. <laughs> you know, could have been anything. And what happens next is that inside that bubble the air is going into itself and that's alan dean foster's science fiction book called into the out of <laughs> oh I, I lost you look at you you're all your mind's all over the place i, I know you I know that mind does that you are creating another universe every time you do that. Well, I, mean, I just think like I'm thinking, I start thinking. I'm, every, I'm trying to think about every different possibility you said, uh, you know, like, um, I, no, I, you talk about or to do things I can relate to in the book a lot. You talk about Oregon and C60, which is buckyballs. Um, I do you think both the, I think both those are really important. It's like, well, I have, I have, I, uh, okay, I discovered. Full arranged, didn't know that at the time when I did an artifact uh, in Chicago. It was an artifact it was an object, it, was a, it had, you know, it's large. And what I did is I fired a 60 caliber, a 50 caliber cannon at it, and then went down with an electron microscope to look at what it did. I was a solid state physicist. And what did it do? Well, that's where the whole concept of electrophoresis evolved. Memory. The ordinance hit the, the object and it collapsed it down into a rubble. And then it just started to flow right back into shape again. We today call that fullerenes. They have the they're harder than diamond. And it's the way carbon, which is only one element we've studied so far, bonds to itself with 60 or 120 molecules. That's why they call it C60 or C120. And Jerry Pollack did that with water, which is a molecule. And now we're doing it with an element. And what I'm going to do is talk about the multiverse and the way all of those variables fit together into something even larger. And remember, I'm the one that says you can't get there from here. <laughs> you can get close. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. And your brain is doing the same thing with science and religion. Well, I'm of two minds of this. That's about a Batman. You flip the coin up, two face. Pull it. That's interesting. <laughs> it's a way of looking at things. It isn't the way, but it's the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I made you speechless. Look at you. You yeah. are you're creating some universes right now. I can't even believe it. And that is going to be the field theory that I'm going to write next that will supersede my holographic concept by 47 years with these two Russians. I'm honored to do that because they're bringing me out of retirement <laughs> so that we can go to Stockholm just like Paul Newman did on the prize. <laughs> I want to get the lady at the end of the movie and have some intrigue. Actually, if truth be known, my bucket list includes opening for live from New York. <laughs> I would love to be on Saturday Night Live. If I make it to Stockholm, I'm going to make it known that that's my bucket list. I, I've got some creepy concepts I'd like to do in comedy on Saturday Night Live. Take it over the edge. You know, that's historically got to be one of the finest comedy systems ever, ever evolved. Chicago tried to do it with, with uh, uh, what was it called back then? It, it, it had John Candy and uh, Martin Short. Martin like Short. Mad TV? Martin, was it Mad TV? Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They, what they did, Martin Short's a, a pharmacist taking his own pills. Oh, ah, I can handle it. And then two midgets walk in. Oh, no. <laughs> Pop some more pills. I can have it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that humor, like the Greek had it, tragedy and comedy. Comedy is the cavitation of tragedy and how you can make something copable. Coping is the best word I would call it. Everybody has pain. You just don't want to notice it. You want to cope, put it down below a certain level of threshold of awareness. And that's what medications do. You can do that with your mind. And that's one of the reasons why I am the physicist that didn't blow himself up. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Alistair Crowley. Crowley, please, not the, the. <laughs> you say tomato, I say tomato. Is it oh, one thing? One thing I, one thing I mentioned was the, I wanted to talk to you about the microtubules because I I had a guy come on my show. He told me that the microtubules he he saw and he he was heard a, neuro, a neurosurgeon and he said that we have these microtubules and they drain out of our brain electricity when we die electricity drains out of our drain. Our drains out of our brain and it goes in from these microtubules and it acts in a quantum way. And does, what does Chapter this Chapter seven that you referred to in my book on time travel, at the moment of death, there's a five gram in this chapter, there's a five gram weight loss. What is that? It's not urine. What? Where do those five grams go? And I suggest. There are in microtubules with structured water in it on the outside of your brain, outside of your body. And that is chi, just one of many subtle bodies that you're dialoguing with in dream states and in some forms being able to direct it with consciousness like my Sifu, John Leon. So what does that say about what we are then? Like, and what about? Um, yeah. what, well, yeah. it tells me, suggests to me what we are not. We're not God. Yeah. That, and so, there, so there is no uh, existence of a God then maybe? Okay. Or? Well, if I were doing this podcast with you and let's say England 100 years ago, what would the farmer think about that? Now imagine an alien group of life forms that have had 10,000 years of, both, of evolution. What I find interesting is that historically we have epochs and we have, quote, been here before. 
like the Vermana, and now we have, you know, a rocket ship or whatever. I have to say that if time isn't real, what does that make your son and your grandfather? And then I would say to you, oh, so you have some choices here. Once you have that concept, where are you going to go with it? And that's why we have the concept of saints and, and uh, non-humans interfacing with humans all the time. The, Pierce Brosnan did a very interesting movie once called Nomads. Where they're, okay. And we have Lycoming and uh, werewolves. Historically, we have Bigfoot, we have Chupacabra. We have all kinds of life forms. I, one of my studies I did for the military, I encountered a shapeshifter. I actually did. It was a dog down at the other end of, uh, of the alley. And the dog looked at me and knew who I was. And because he knew who I was, he charged at me and came at me. And just before he hit me, turned into a wisp of dust and went between my legs. I filmed it. The military has it as a record. That's what I did for the military. Nobody else could deal with this paranormal stuff. And so they stuck me there. We knew about aliens back then in the 70s. But at that time, you have to remember, we were in the space race and Sputnik and moon landings and stuff like that. And so we, uh, we were more concerned about what the Russians were doing. Turns out back then, the Russians weren't doing as much as they do today. It was probably Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia, they were so conceptually far ahead of anything any of us conceived of. That's where I found my most interesting studies were in the, some of the Czech things, that psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain, Ostrander and Schroeder. They have um, a new one out, or an older, it's way back, called Psychic Discoveries in America. They have a whole two pages on my work in that book. And that's back in the 70s. So, you know, I was, at one time, I was something. Now I'm just grumpy and old. <laughs> I need to have income, buy my books. That's how I, that's the only source of support I have. And they're trying to take me out, keep me on a short leash. Um, I actually did uh, studies for the military. Because remember, I talked about electromagic. And the diamond body is on, on your cymatics, the study I did on that. Uh, the third book, Yogatronics, is how I create my own wormhole and doing the Mars project and go to Mars. And I've been to Mars. I have, uh, if, if, to document that for your own satisfaction, uh, do a Google search under the Mars project. You have to do the Mars project, caps, comma, Warnicky correction, which is a part of the brain. Let's see where that takes you. Wow, uh, be interesting. that's amazing. Um, that's 83 and why sacred geometry, certain sacred geometries set up resonant cavity oscillations in the brain. That is what the biologists did on their proton cloud has to do with resonant cavity oscillators, how one subsystem dialogues with the next one up like we are as a life form. Wow. Was, so you went to Mars in your mind, you're saying. You went to Mars with your mind. You, you, you traveled there in the mind. You remote viewed it, right? The mind is a second, can be seen limitedly as a second gut dialoguing with subtle bodies outside the physical body. Now, John Curtis Gowan, which is discussed in Power Tools, for the 21st century, the second book in the series, he was uh, at Northridge and did the psych development of the psychedelic individual. And by the way, the psychedelic individual has nothing to do with drugs or psychedelics. Psychedelic is a term used for awareness. That's why they call it psychedelic. And uh, just giving you another key to not to confuse with well, man, let's do it, huh? Gnarly. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, 
a place where he wrote his most important work for me was an ontology of mystical states called trance, art, and creativity. And trance states is where the shaman can take his consciousness and place it in the, into the eagle and see what the eagle sees. That's a very limited form of consciousness. Uh, witches That's use that shaman. too. Witches, witches use that. They, they call it a, a familiar, where they, they'll use a cat and they'll 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 uh, they'll use the, I don't know if they use their consciousness, but they use some kind of spell okay. work. And, and, and so they, the second stage, it's called parataxic modes of consciousness, dealing with dream states and and mythology, where you use I, my book on that subject is going to be the magical and ritual use of metaphor, archetypal gods in daily living. And that will be my book on tarot. There are 22 stories in the big city using Greek technology and mythology. And uh, one of the chapters is when Persephone has to go back into Hades each year into hell. And that could be, for example, you take drugs only at Christmas time, you know, as a metaphor. And basically the Greeks were saying, you're either a Jungian psychotherapy. My teacher, James Hillman said, there's, you know, mythology associated with the way you do your life. So you can categorize it in certain categories, like 22 of them, according to the tarot, okay, in terms of you're either possessed, which means you only have one storyboard going on, or you're complexed, which means you have more than one, one storyboard going on. Most of us have five to seven that are easily recognized. Each one has an ending like Persephone. If you don't like the ending, you change the movie. And that's done with pathworking. That's my magic. That's the way I understand magic as a physicist. And you have options, they're, they're gross. Again, quantized, because they're subtle in-betweens. And every uniqueness of all humans, so there's someone that has something slightly different than that or that, this or that. It's not something, what in the hell is that? Bang, what is that? Live from New York. <laughs> oh, no, man. They have each decade had its own different kinds of humor, and I don't care much for that one, but that, that decade, oh, wow. That's John Bellucci. You ought to see my new post office box. <laughs> 1942. His best movie ever, in my humble opinion. John Bellucci did a fighter pilot. Yeah, man. Yeah. And he's flying out of LA shooting Japanese aircraft in 1942. What do you think he's really doing? Oh, no, man. Oh, it's a great movie. Wait, did uh, you ever see the movie? Speaking of John Bellucci, did you ever see the movie Salvador? Where oh, yeah. That's a great movie where they're down in El Salvador. Uh, I can't remember what it's a. I just it's a good movie. It's a That's movie. Your yuppies buy property down there right now because of the, the, the banks and all the rest of the way it works down there in terms of your own castle. Good luck with that. Watch the card telling what they do next, man. <laughs> you thought hell on earth. Well, this is why it's called purgatory. You know, we're halfway here and halfway there. Sort of, kind of, maybe, huh? Yeah. The glass is either half full or it's half empty. But we're, we were definitely, I can tell from what you say, we're in a holographic universe. And I have the book right here. This is amazing, man. Like, I, I really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm going to enjoy this book. I should just as well, I know, I'm going to write something even more. <laughs> I'm going to write a new field theory before I turn into worm food. You can use me on, on your spaceship to Mars. You can't get there from here with a vehicle in space. We've already tried rats. I, when I was at Mission Control, the reason they have the precision of countdown, five, four, is they have to punch a hole in the ionosphere for the astronaut to get through it. That hole has to exist before the countdown. Boo. That's why they do the precision on the countdown. Did we go to the moon when we said we did? Ah, <laughs> uh, good luck. Mitchell was my one of my friends. He has a corporation called Ion. He's dead now, but in fact, you know, all my friends are dead. 
Well, wait, I got I got something to yeah, ask real quick. You you said you worked you went for Edward Mitchell. I just interviewed Stan Deo the other day. He's from your your generation. Did you guys know each other? Yeah. He, he's pretty cool too. He uh. Yeah. Well, I, we were the ones that went to Haight Ashbury <laughs> before Twinstock. <laughs> yeah, I took my first TED of LSD when I was twenty years old in 1964, when it was still legal. And Harvard wanted to do a study on geniuses and see what it did to them. And I was one of 10 that were chosen in that study. And uh, they, Larry came out and talked to my mom for us, who was a pretty heavy duty hitter. She, has, she had Vesta Cutting and Associates, which is a spy network similar to what Gordon Duff does and uh, today. Out of Seattle, we're one of the founding families, but I didn't have to play in that arena because uh, I was a nerd and they wanted me to be the wizard from Oz. And so they allowed me to free reign rather than have to play politics in Seattle and, you know, be upper. I came from a lower middle class family. Mom made this fortune and had the Fourth and Pike building uh, in Seattle at one point and uh, on the whole thing. And so dad and my father, my father was possibly the best thing that ever happened to me also because he taught me how to lay brick and do cabinet work and diversity of things, which made me, you know, a poly something or other. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, I was lucky. Um, it's uh, flip the coin. Good luck. I'm flat broke. They kept me on a short lease with Amazon, publishing all my works, older works, under other people, and I don't see a cent of that. Well, where and do they where do they get your new book, the the holographic mind? You get that at my website only at this juncture, at richardallenmiller.com. All right, and everybody, go to his website and buy. I mean, I I think this is, this book is so worth it. I mean. You, it's only a taste of what you'll get, you know, like he, he, I, 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 I highly recommend it, you know, and I, I mean, like, I, I, I think richardallenmiller.com, right? Yeah. You're stuttering. Don't worry. Thank you, though, for the promotion, because that in Florida, uh, I was not in Navy. I was the civilian they hired because they didn't have anyone like me in Navy. And one of the reasons they've ruled the waves for more than 400 years, it's not CIA, <laughs> I know, CIA, 10 years after my studies was giving kids LSD and watching them jump out of a building. Whereas I'm gonna to try to use lysergic acid MI neurotransmitters as a way to dialogue in subtle bodies outside the physical and have the strength of 10. Wow. Faster than the speed of light. <laughs> you know that's cool well it's i want something more out of our life i want to evolve into something i'm potentially capable of but have no awareness of because once i have awareness of it it's mine it's a good way to think yeah well th thanks a lot for doing this uh dr ram like th this was awesome can we get together for this part two and maybe a part three? Oh yeah <laughs> that will be lots more where that came from. How's that? I don't know anybody that has published as many different diverse areas of field. And, you know, even Shakespeare didn't do that. Oh, Francis Bacon, who? <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. You, you're, you're, uh, people don't, re you're really, this is really is a treat for me to have you on the show. Like, I was lucky, you know, like, and I hope that some other big shows will see my show and, uh, in some other oh, we'll get there from here but you know and i'd be honored to do different interviews with you i have agendas of course but i love inquiring minds and especially young ones our children in my humble opinion are possibly our most important natural resource and what we're doing in their educational process now is abominable oh yeah it's terrible and as a, by the way, uh, what you're smoking nicotine, when I had my herb company, I had uh, Golden Eagle 
herbal chew, which was non-toxic using natural products. Uh, because, you know, where I came from, they used to put a big plug in their mouth and they spit and then their gums <laughs> fall out afterwards and they're spitting out their teeth. Um, what I used was red clover because it has a pistol on it that's hollow. And I put the glycerin inside that because it stays fresh like that. And uh, actually, you can swallow it. You don't have to spit. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, because when you smoke, you're killing a bunch of bacteria in your gut, limiting where you can go. News flash. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> just thought I'd pop that little one in there just to irritate it's Limiting you. my psychic abilities is what you're saying. Well, it, it, no, it's not. Uh, dietary choices in Oregon right now, one person in four is not fat, they're obese. What do you think that does to health? Yeah. yeah. Well, think about it. And then you have to define what health is. Yeah, well, I like to be a bar fly. What do I do? Man? <laughs> so, you know, personal choice and nothing's wrong. My glass, your glass, all our glasses are actually half full, just like they're half empty. And you have a choice on how you choose to see what health is, you know, awareness is, and so on. And I personally want something more. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll end it with that. That's a good, that's a good way to end it. That's a good way to end it. Well, thank, thank you for doing this. This is awesome. <laughs>